not assassinate this bad person. And if you look, you've done enough. Have you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you left no sense of decency? I appreciate everything that you've done to the community there. I also have appreciated the opportunity to meet you several times. Chairman, if, if we cannot be recognized, I move to adjourn. Chairman, I move to adjourn. And I would never do to them what you've done to this guy. This is the most unethical sham since I've been in politics. And if you really wanted to know the truth, you sure as hell wouldn't have done what you've done to this guy. Your panelists for this session are the Attorney General of Iowa, the longest continually serving state Attorney General in the nation. He's held the office more than 35 years, Harvard Law graduate who has served with five Iowa governors, Tom Miller. That's pretty impressive. And the former White House press secretary under President Bill Clinton. Currently, the distinguished professor of public theology at Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C., and a consultant for the D.C. based communications firm Public Strategies, Mike McCurry. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here in this, the final session of our summit. My name is Kevin Cooney. I used to be on KCCI TV a long time ago. Uh, this is the Congressional Investigations and Hearings, How Do We Get to the Truth in a Civil Manner session. And the question is, how do we do it? And what I'm talking about is actually getting to the truth in a civil manner. Stop having congressional <laughs> hearings. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Congressional hearings are one thing, and um, but I think as we were talking beforehand, we'd like to kind of expand this a little bit, not just to congressional hearings, which as you can see, can be quite civil, but also uh, just about any form of lawmaking, if you will, um, maybe just government in general. We're going to get some thoughts out during the first part of our session, and during the second half, we'll take your questions. We are going to ask that you write your questions down on one of the cards that you may have received while you came in. If you need another card or so, just raise your hand. And uh, when you have a question written down, just kind of hold it up and one of the folks here will be able to pick it up and hand it down to us for the second half. So now, getting to the truth. Hmm, interesting question. Is the truth really a goal anymore, gentlemen? Call me a cynic, but how much truth-seeking was there at the Mueller hearings? How much truth-seeking was there at the Kavanaugh hearings? And is civility a relative thing? Even within government, certain civility at the House Judiciary Committee might not be the same standard as uh, civility at the Supreme Court, Tom. Um, so what is civility in government? Is it decorum? Is it Robert's Rules of Order? Is it respect? Where do we begin? 
Mike McCurry, let's begin with you. Civility, talking at people or talking with people? I uh, go back to one of the conversations earlier today. It really is about building relationships. Um, I first started working on Capitol Hill in the United States Senate in 1976, and I worked for the then chairman of the Labor Committee in the U.S. Senate, Harrison Williams. His ranking Republican member, he was a Democrat, his ranking Republican member was Jacob Javits. The two of them, I think, because they agreed on a lot of things, they both, frankly, were pro-labor, uh, but they collaborated back and forth across the aisle in doing the work of that, that committee. Uh, there was a working relationship there. There was a level of respect. Um, there was a sense that you did not, you know, trample on the rights and privileges of your colleagues. I'll do one quick story. One point during a very uh, difficult debate on labor law reform in 1979, I was Senator Williams press secretary. I drafted a press release uh, because the, the filibuster against the bill was being led by Orrin Hatch, and he had been making a lot of arguments about how this would lead to mandatory unionization. And I drafted a press release quote where they had a quote from my boss saying, any senator who says this leads to mandatory unionization is stretching truth to the breaking point. <laughs> that was the quote. The guy who was the chief of staff and kind of my mentor, uh, I gave him the draft of this and he said, come with me. He took me outside in the hall and he said, you better be damn glad this never went out because I would have had to fire you because we don't talk like that in the United States Senate. So stretching truth to the breaking point, that kind of <laughs> seems rather milk toast now <laughs> yes, in the vocabulary that you hear. But my, my point is that we have seen uh, my other boss, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan in the Senate says we dumb deviancy down. I think we have seen uh, the level of discourse descend over this time. And maybe part of the reason is we have not had those folks who will tell bright young press secretaries to knock it off, that we don't talk like that, we don't use that kind of language. So is that a role for the media to play? Uh, should they be calling out more of this incendiary language? Is that a role that other leaders in the community could do? As it mentioned that I, I work now in theological education, I think there's probably a role that clergy and churches should be playing here too help this country get back to a place where we have respectful civil discourse because we are going to a very, very bad place. And as the last panel just said, we could very well have one of the nastiest elections ever in 2020. Can I follow up just on one thing that you talked about, you know, if you, that eventually things got worse. What changed? Was it, was it a gradual change? I mean, we, I think everybody here will agree that it's changed, as you said, but what, was there a, a, a benchmark moment? We, we have, I think we've explored a lot of the reasons today. Obviously, it's, it's, part of it is the sensationalism that some members of Congress seek. That's why we have these congressional hearings that are very explosive, uh, that you know, focus on whatever is going to grab the public attention at the moment. I think it's a combination of that, and it's also the vocabulary and language used in politics now, particularly when it comes to fundraising, began to make a difference. I think the advent of the direct mail solicitation, when people were really trying to arouse emotion and get people to turn over money uh, to campaigns, to candidates, uh, I think that's, you can trace a lot of that back to the 1970s when that industry really began uh, to take off. But I think the obvious uh, addition to that now is social media and the ability of people to, who almost think that they are anonymous. And there, there is a, a peculiar thing, we need good psychologists to explain this, why people think that they can say things online and on the internet that they would never say you know, in polite company sitting around a dinner table. Uh, so the behavior is different somehow or other because of the technology that we're using. But I think it's a combination of several things like that. Tom Miller, jump in here. You have been involved in, in, in politics and electoral politics um, for the better part of uh, four decades. A while anyway, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, just to remind you. And I, uh, I told time, I said, I think they just said you're, you're kind of old. <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, I know that. I know yeah. that. <laughs> 
Uh, Mike brought up, you know, some of the things that, that, that have changed. Let me ask you about this. You know, uh, election laws have changed in terms of advertising. If you're a candidate, you could go on and buy a commercial on television and say anything you want to, true or not true. And the television station has to, add, uh, has to air that. They, they can't edit it. They can't refuse it. As you as a candidate, now, if you're a... Uh, a campaign committee uh, or not connected, you know, if you're an adversarial group or something like that, and by time, that's a whole different thing. If you're a candidate, we can't, as broadcasters, can't say no to you. That, that's right. And let me, let me expand a little bit on what Mike said um, in terms of how we, how we got here in, in regard to lack of civility. Uh, for me, I think there were four forces that came together over a relatively long period of time. Uh, the first was uh, the move to, to really strong, I would suggest, extreme partisan, partisanship uh, that became, really began in earnest in, in the 90s, that, that, it, that it really changed in terms of, uh, of attacks, uh, in terms of how dug in the parties were, how they responded to each other. And that went on for, for a period of years. And then along came uh, talk radio and uh, cable news um, and sort of played into that. To, to some great extent. Um, and then the third force that, that I think is, is significant was nationalism. Uh, um, that um, there's, there's, a, there's a pretty broad group of Americans that are what I would call nationalist, a much, much, much bigger group than, than we thought a few years ago. And then the forced element was Trump. Um, that Trump really, um, to give him some sort of credit, uh, is, was a genius in terms of understanding um, uh, particularly nationalism and, and that, that group of voters um, and captured them in a way that, that nobody else has or, or probably could. So you, know, you, you, look at, you look at the mix of, of those four things and it's, it's a very powerful mix. Um, on the other hand, Kevin showed uh, the McCarthy hearings. Um, in a lot of ways, the McCarthy hearings were much worse than anything we've seen, uh, we've seen lately. And Mike gave some examples of, of uh, of civility and, and bipartisanship, and that, that still that still happens, um, you know, more often than you think um, in America today. And I would I would highlight, uh, given my partiality, the state attorney generals um, generally were a pretty remarkable group of, of bipartisan folks that that worked together on on a lot of different issues. My best friend, for instance, uh, among the attorney generals is is Lawrence Wasden, uh, the attorney general of Idaho, who happens to be a Republican. Uh, recently, when there was a changeover of, of some of the um, uh, attorney generals, um, uh, uh, the, the new attorney general of, of Ohio called me up uh, and said um, that he would like me to be his mentor. That you, can, you can have a mentor as you go through the, the, the process. And he said the reason was that, that he was tired of partisanship, that he wanted to work across, the, across party lines, and he, he thought that, that I was the kind of person that would do that. Um, and he did something that, that's pretty extraordinary. He and another attorney general, Tim Fox, in Montana, is also a friend and a remarkable person. Um, a few months ago, they came out against the litigation uh, that was trying to, to, up, to, to end uh, the Affordable Care Act, um, which was a, you know, a very significant and, 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 and very, in my, my view, very brave act. So, I mean, there, there, are, there are examples. Some of the governors, uh, Hickenlooper and Kasich, uh, got together on health care a while back. Um, so there are examples of, of people that, uh, um, that do uh, go across party lines, that do engage in civility. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I think, I think keep your eye on them and to the extent that, that they can be encouraged in one way or another and, um, and even rewarded to some extent is, would be very helpful. Mike, I realize that you weren't a press secretary during the entire Clinton administration, but you were there for enough of it to see a lot of this happening. Uh, Tom was talking about the early 90s. Uh, I was there for some of the zestier moments. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> zestier. Um, but how does this affect uh, a, a president's effort to work on an agenda to get either a particular bill or a particular philosophy through. When, when things start going negative is one thing, but when things start getting nasty. Well, this polarization, I think, 
has infected all the institutions of government now. The, the title of this panel is about Congress, but Congress is so polarized that it really is not doing a great deal of legislating. It's not wrestling with larger questions because it's just frankly difficult to get the two parties to come together and, and do that work together. Um, I think it's also been affected by the fact that there's not a very strong and particular agenda uh, that the current administration has put forward. You know, aside from building the wall and a few other uh, things, uh, the Trump administration has not tried to uh, pursue some really expansive uh, legislative agenda. So that creates more opportunities for mischief on Capitol Hill because if they are not legislating, uh, they are very interested in doing something that will keep the public uh, paying attention. And so then you get some of the theater of the, of the absurd that you see at some of these hearings where people are really stretching uh, to try to draw attention to get the attention of the cameras. And I think uh, that contributes to the problem. You know, I, I was thinking about that in, in the connection of just the, the fact that the congressional hearings have become so poisoned. You know, one of the reasons for that might in part be because we began to televise the sessions of the House and the Senate themselves. So members had an opportunity to go give thoughtful addresses on the floor. They could send that video back to their home states and get some credit for the things they were saying. But uh, it, it, it then cre you know, created this, this monster on the other side, which is the hearings, where they really then go and, and fight things out. Because on the floor of the House and the floor of the Senate, for the most part, you're supposed to behave in somewhat more decorous manner. Uh, as an elected official. So I mean, it's a combination of a lot of these things, I think. What happens when the television lights and the television cameras aren't there, either at the local legislative level or at the national level? Are the hearings more civil? The ones that we don't see, the ones that we might read about in the third paragraph on the 43rd page? <laughs> and, and it's a very, very good point. Uh, and the members tend not to show up. Yeah, that's right. Uh, They're not there. <laughs> the cameras are not there. The, the chairman and, and, and right. one other person. But, you know, one thing, I've, ta I've talked to the, some of the network uh, executives that, that are responsible for Washington coverage, and one thing that I've said is, you know, you should cover more of what we call the markup sessions. That's when they're actually doing the work of legislating, where they're sitting around a table, sleeves rolled up. Uh, it, it's, it might be incredibly boring, but it you know, shows the, the fact that we can see people really doing the business of the people and do it in a fashion in which they're trading things back and forth. And it's, and it's an environment much different than what we just saw in these hearings because they're actually doing real work. But it, it, it is rare that you ever see TV cameras in covering that kind of uh, business. What happens in the judiciary side of things? Is there... <laughs> Is there this sort of animosity? I mean, you know, you always picture Perry Mason, you know, making the big argument and stuff like that in a courtroom, you know, and that sort of uh, animosity. But um, what about at the at the executive uh, judiciary level? Yeah, I, you know, at, at times there there's some some pretty heavy tension and animosity at the, at the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, particularly in various, you know, the various, the two various factions, but that's that's relatively rare, um, and um, and also you hear you hear and read the stories about uh, Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg and um, you know with with the conservatives uh, uh, on, a, on a personal level and a friendship level, so I think I think the court um, has tension from time to time, and some of that might even be healthy tension. Uh, but nothing like we see um, at the, the, the presidential level and, and the congressional level. And just on the, you know, on, on the positive side, uh, relative to the court, I, I do want to make a point, and that is <clears throat> that the, the, the U.S. court system, the U.S. federal court system, um, did something that was incredibly important to our republic um, in, uh, two years ago. Um, and that is that... Um, um, essentially, they, they stood up to, to, to President Trump. Um, the Trump really, you know, I think thought he can control most everything, um, including, including the courts where he wanted to. And there was one really sensitive point that wasn't covered as much as it should, maybe, and that was when 
he started his travel ban uh, efforts. Um, there were three efforts, two, uh, two were rejected by the courts, the third was approved by the Supreme Court five to four. But early on there was a judge, a single judge, that, uh, that made the decision. And he tried to pressure the judge. He talked about um, if there was some sort of uh, a terrorist attack caused by the judge's decision. Um, it was a real attempt to, uh, to pressure him. Uh, that judge stood up uh, to him. And the other judges throughout the process of the travel ban uh, did as well. Um, and I think, I think we, we should give a lot of credit to, to Chief, judge, Chief Justice Roberts uh, for essentially standing up to, to Trump on, on a variety of issues, including uh, it culminated in the question is, of is there Obama judges and, uh, and uh, uh, Republican judges uh, or are they you know, federal judges? He stood up on that. But generally, um, you know, he, in a number of ways, he wasn't going to totally buy into what Trump wanted. Um, and that was, that was an enormous, enormously important um, and, and, and I think very significant. There are no television cameras in the federal courts as a rule. There are some exceptions, but there's audio recordings and audio uh, recordings of the Supreme Court. Should there be television cameras in the Supreme Court? And if so, would the justices start grandstanding, do you think? Yeah. Um, you know, there probably should. There, there, isn't a, there, isn't a strong, there isn't a strong rationale, I don't think, to keep them out. Um, uh, the, one, the one reason that I was sensitive to is that Justice Souter, who I had a great deal of respect for, former state attorney general, said he would re re retire if they put cameras in. Well, he has, he has since retired, um, so we wouldn't, we wouldn't lose him. So I, 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 I think it makes sense. But, you know, um, there hasn't been a lot of coverage in state court in the in the, in the mm -hmm. state courts, and um, and you can watch the, Supreme, the the state supreme court live. You can watch it live on, online if you want. Um, but particularly given you know what we people talked about earlier, what the public is interested in, and the kind of coverage, you know, hearing it hearing it. A, an argument or a court proceeding is, is not very high level, up on the, on the sort of attractive or energy level. Some of them level are. are. Some of them not, are. But not very many. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it's a good idea. I think they should. In fact, I have two good friends on the court. Uh, Sonia Sotomayor is a college classmate of mine in LA. Elena Kagan was a, a colleague of mine at the Clinton White House. And they're, they're both marvelous, by the way. It would be entertaining to watch them. But, you know, the level of conversation and questioning when they do their oral, when there's oral arguments in the Supreme Court would be, I think, very difficult for most Americans to follow because they're usually going at very pinpoint matters of law that have been in the briefs and they're asking questions about that. It's not, you, you know, you would, you'd need to have color commentary by someone good. Or translation, uh, maybe. Yeah, or simultaneous <laughs> translation yeah. to, really, to really understand that. But it is, a, I mean, the, the point is it would be such a better spectacle than what we see sometimes in Congress, uh, what we see in our political campaigns, uh, to see the real work of government and the real uh, deliberation that happens. I mean, that, I think there would be some level of appreciation by Americans that at least we have things that work. You know, that's what, one of my complaints about the media from time to time is they focus so much on the dysfunction and on the fact that we seem to have systems that are broken. Uh, that they miss the opportunity when things really do work and when folks do do some work on a bipartisan fashion. Uh, they need to cover more of that. They, you know, they, the, the answer I get back very often from uh, news executives is, well, that, that's not news. They're doing what they're supposed to do. And we're there to kind of you know, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. You know, that's, you know, that's what our job is. Uh, but I, we are at such a time when there's such... Uh, general despair about the condition of our democracy, that I think we need more positive examples of things that really are working uh, to give, re maybe restore some confidence to the American people that it, it matters and that they should participate and they should pay attention. Uh, but I want, I want to make one other comment, it kind of came out of some of the conversation earlier. We've, we've got to do a better job, particularly in the K through 12 system of educating kids about what is real news? Uh, this, this, we, we call it news literacy. Uh, there has to be, I think, it, it, there also has to be a thing called civics, which Tom Miller and I probably had when we went to we high school. But by and large, it doesn't seem to be taught that much now in our 
uh, public school system. So, you know, starting at an earlier age to get particularly young people to understand uh, what is legitimate comment? What are legitimate uh, content sources? Where are sources that you can go to actually get useful and accurate information? Not everything comes from Wikipedia. Uh, you know, you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to help particularly young people learn how to use this technology and these tools and really understand uh, why they need to have this content in the first place because it's going to impact their lives eventually. Well, what is the media's role when it comes, you touched a little bit upon it, but what is the media's role when it comes to uh, reporting in civility? Is it news or is it, where as, I guess I can still call myself a member of the media, uh, where is our responsibility? Is it, is it just salacious coverage because it's interesting, because uh, uh, something was drawn on a map or because something was tweeted somewhere or uh, is there some substance to this? Is there, is there actually a reason to report this sort of, um, uh, well, the incivility? You're looking at, looking at <laughs> me. Um, <coughs> Does I, it reflect I, on the character of the in, uncivil? So I would, um, I, I proposed this in a blog and didn't get much response to it. I would urge my friends in the White House press corps many of them are folks who were there when I was there and they're still there now, to just not show up at the White House and not cover the tweets and just turn Trump off and go cover other parts of government that actually have some real impact on our lives. You know, when I first started working on Capitol Hill, they, they, they had full-time reporters at the Agriculture Department or at the EPA or at the Department of Health and Human Su Services. And that's all shriveled up now, and so much of our coverage of the working of government gets funneled through the choke point of the White House. And when you have utter nonsense coming out of the White House, you know, beginning at 6.40 with the first tweet in the morning, it, it just distorts the whole conversation that we could have. So I wish a lot of those reporters would just say, we're not covering Trump today. We're not covering this craziness. And we're gonna go out and actually find the things that really do matter, that really are real policy, that really do have some impact on the American people, and we're gonna cover that. Now, that'll never happen, by the way, but it would be a more useful uh, purpose for all of those very talented journalists that are at that White House every day uh, to actually go cover something real instead of the insanity that comes out of the president's mouth. What's, what's the public's responsibility do you think, Tom, in terms of uh, filtering un incivil, uncivil behavior? Uh, well, or has, has the public changed? Has the public become more uncivil? Well, I mean, ultimately the public uh, has a lot of responsibility. I mean, the, Repub the, the public uh, ultimately makes an incredibly important decision next year in November. Um, this presidential election is, is gonna be certainly one of the most important ones um, you know, in, in, in a long time. And the public really needs to make some decisions about um, civility and, and whether, they, uh, uh, whether they want it or, or don't want it. Um, they, may, they need to make some decisions on, uh, on facts, whether, whether we should be pursuing facts or whether we should be, we sh whether we should be closed-minded. Um, the, you know, the next four years is certainly in, in implications well beyond the next four years is gonna be decided by, by the public. Um, and, um, you know, I, I have a lot of faith in the public. Um, I think particularly over the long term, the public gets, gets a lot of things right. Um, but on, on a more day-to-day -day basis, the public, um, um, I think, needs to, uh, to try and be discerning as to what are the facts and what aren't the facts. Uh, the public needs to <coughs> push away from, from some of the incivility and, re re and reward uh, politicians and people in media that, that engage in incivility. Um, so ultimately, you know, the public has a huge amount of responsibility and is gonna make just a, an incredibly important decision um, a little more than a year from now. I, I think fighting this thing that we call confirmation bias, that people seek out sources of information that generally reflect what they already are predisposed to, to believe. 
uh, that's going to require a lot of work. And again, I would I would sort of say it's educating people about uh, different types of news sources and where to go to get information. But you know, one thing I think the the mainstream media could do, whether it's the great newspapers that we have or uh, television stations that you know still most Americans tune into to get a balance of their news is to really help sort things out for us, to give us a table of contents. And so you could say, here are a set of you know, posts or content sites today that have got this information, but if you want a contrary point of view, go to these sites. So really almost set it up so that you require a reader or a viewer to engage in the conversation from both points of view. Uh, I think we could help them a little bit more in the way in which the media presents this information to, to put it in a different form and different packages so that it becomes more accessible. I think that would be a, a good starting point. Yeah. And, and the public could engage in conversations with friends or acquaintances that have different views and, in, a, you know, in a civil, <laughs> meaningful way. That's, that's, that's something the public could, could do and would be a very helpful thing. Do we judge each other now based on our political party? I mean, I, I didn't seem to be when, you know, mom and dad were out, uh, you know, having a barbecue in the back in the 50s or 60s or something like that, that there was so much politicking going on uh, that, you know, the neighbors were ranged from, you know, right to left and everywhere in between. Politics may have been a topic, but it didn't decide, uh, it wasn't a deciding factor as to who was a friend. Yeah, now you know, it is. Sociologists would tell us that we are increasingly congregating and living in and around people that we basically feel are like we are, uh, that we seek out kind of folks that we think are similar to us in both where we choose to live, uh, where we choose to socialize. But haven't together. we always done that, Mike? Probably, I mean, ethnically probably or religiously some, or whatever? Probably to some degree, but I think that the homogeneity of communities is something that has been on the increase, or at least that's what, what we're told by, by the experts. And I think we, again, thinking of what are the ways in which you can actually counter that. Now, some of the work I do, and the work I do at uh, Wesley Theological Seminary, is training young people who are gonna go out and serve in churches to be more equipped to guide these kinds of conversations. Now, even in churches, we see some of this homogenization taking place. However, on a typical Sunday, that the likelihood that you might have in the pew next to you, who's someone who's from a different political party or a different, some different persuasion is higher. And churches need to get into that conversation. You know, a lot of people say, oh, separation of church and state. You know, we don't want to have that. Uh, we don't want to bring politics into the church. But, it, it, you know, where else are we going to go to have those kinds of conversations uh, or stimulate those kind of conversations? Because our political parties, I don't think, Tom, we could say are doing a particularly good job of fostering that kind of dialogue. Uh, and we certainly do, not communicating with the other side. Correct. And we, I mean, we do have some valuable community organizations that do that. I mean, this summit is a good, good example of that. Uh, but I think on a regular basis, we need to find some ways to, to create safe sanctuaries for conversations where people really will talk in a civil way about their differences. Yeah. Now, my church, uh, Lutheran, Her Hope, Lutheran Church of Hope, uh, recently, the uh, the, 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 the lecture that, that was on, on leadership um, and was, was a wonderful demonstration of, of what we, we need to do in terms of, of leadership in the community and implications for political leaders to do uh, some of the same, implement some of the same values. Um, you know, the, the churches can play a role. And also at, at Hope, um, they do really do a good job of, of hewing to the beliefs of the church uh, but not demonizing or disliking in any, in any way people that don't. And mm -hmm. that, that's important today. Uh, just a reminder, I'm sure there are probably some questions, so a reminder to you know, write down your questions, and Jeff has a few back there, and if you uh, have one, just kind of pass it to the aisle and hold it up, and, and they'll pick it up. Um, I want to circle back to, uh, to lawmaking and, and Congress in just a moment, but I do want to kind of deal with a fundamental thing, and that is you know, defining um, civil and um, uncivil behavior. Uh, I gotta be honest with you, you know, three white guys in their 60s and 70s sitting here in front of a, 
an audience uh, that uh, looks um, uh, mostly younger, but pretty much <laughs> as white. Um, is it, are we just saying um, this is what you, you'll be polite uh, and this is our interpretation of what you have to be, to be polite? I mean, aren't there uh, ethnic differences in terms of what is considered civil behavior, national behavior? Uh, or nationality behavior, you know, someone who comes from one country may have a whole, totally different thing. Someone who comes from the Bronx is, is probably going to have a hard time if he or she starts behaving in front of the Story City uh, school board, you know, the way he was uh, behaving in front of the, uh, uh, the, the, the Bronx, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, school board. Uh, yeah, I, th I think, look, I think we want people with strong opinions and strong convictions. Mm -hmm. uh, we want good vigorous debate uh, from people of different points of view. But maybe w what might work is some version of a political golden rule, that I would not say something about you that I would not want to, that I wouldn't want someone to say about me, or some, some version of that, that I'm, I'm not, I'm gonna treat you the way I expect to be treated myself. And I'm not gonna say something that would, you know, be offensive to you uh, if I thought the same thing would be hurled back at me. And that, I think, might delimit some of the energy and the uh, vituperation that's in some of these conversations because it, 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 it's personal and it gets very, very personal. And I think people need to stop and think about behaviors. And that is, would be, to me, the beginning of civility, that you begin to think about you know, how am I conducting myself mm -hmm. in a public setting or in a political setting or in a conversation where we are trying to reach some kind of agreement. The, the other technique that I think is very, very important, and some folks today have alluded to it, is that you ought to start, if you're gonna have an argument or a debate, you ought to start by restating the other person's point of view in a genuine, authentic way. Say, mm -hmm. what I hear you saying is the following. And state it honestly. And then if you want to take issue with it or argue with it, you've at least created the premise where the other person believes they've been heard and listened to and that there is at least some basis on which you can then have that conversation. I think it, it goes down to even and the way in which we build relationships and have conversations is the beginning of, of how we create a more civil environment. Yeah. Kevin, I think it revolves around one word and one concept, a very important one, and that's respect. Um, if, 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 if we have respect for the person or persons we're dealing with um, and disagree with them, um, you know, that's, that, 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 that's, that's how we do things. But when disrespect creeps in, and gets deeper and deeper and worse and worse, that's where civility just is totally destroyed and totally lost. Um, you know, I, th I, th I think we need to reflect more on, on respect in our, in our relationships than we have, that, that I had the, the good fortune of traveling around this, this wonderful state of Iowa in 2007 with Barack Obama on his campaigns, his campaign. And every day I was with, I watched him very closely, and every day I was with, with him, I learned something. And the biggest lesson I learned from him was respect. He had respect for everybody, um, and pretty much equally. Nobody was better than anybody else. Um, and putting respect back in to the whole environment would just absolutely work wonders. I was talking to Tom Harkin before he retired. And in this interview, he, taught, he, he lamented the fact that members of the legislature, legislative branch don't get together as much as they used to. There used to be, and, and maybe uh, Mike, you can clarify this, I think it was a Wednesday or one particular morning, everybody get together, uh, maybe not all together, but at various places, for breakfast. And they'd sit around and talk, and it made no difference about party or anything like that. Election laws kind of changed, or election philosophy kind of changed, and not the way you might think. It was these guys and ladies and gentlemen could not necessarily afford to come to these meetings anymore because they had to be on the phones at seven o'clock in the morning, talking to donors, trying to raise money. 
And the long-term effect of that is that they didn't have this really constructive session every week where they would sit down and talk to each other. And there was a lot of business that took, time, took place there. So is it more now of a my way or the highway sort of attitude? There, is there that much communication between the Democratic senator from this state and the, Democratic sen uh, the Republican senator from that state? Very, very little. I remember <clears throat> once when Hillary Clinton was uh, a senator from New York, we had a, a very similar kind of conversation. And I said, why is the Senate so dysfunctional? You know, it's supposed to be the you know, world's greatest deliberative body. And I remember the good old days when I worked in the Senate, but why is it so messed up now? And her answer was exactly that. She says, because we really don't know each other and trust each other very much. Uh, you know, if you're gonna go and compromise on something, you wanna know the a person coming the other direction is gonna put something on the table too. So I think it's a combination of that, that lack of that personal trusting relationships. It's also the fact that they now campaign nonstop. So Congress is only there from Tuesday to Thursday. And then they're getting on a jet to go back to their home district as fast as they possibly can. And then the third thing is you, you identified it. When they are in town and not in session or on you know, doing legislative business, they're doing fundraisers. Uh, they're at a fundraising breakfast. They're not sitting down with a colleague. Uh, they're not, you know, going out to dinner. They're not socializing. It, it's frequently said they're not even, because they're not living in Washington, their kids are not playing soccer together and they're not uh, developing those kind of neighborhood relationships either. So I, I love your idea. I, I think that, you know, maybe we would uh, just agree that Wednesday morning is going to be a campaign finance free zone <laughs> and and that our committees this would be have to be enforced by the media we would call people out if they had fundraisers but it would also apply to our campaign uh, parties structures our campaign committees in the house and the senate that, that are uh, challenged with raising money for funds but you just say ask off limits and the expectation is that you're going to go find someone on the other side of the aisle and take them out to breakfast and have some scrambled eggs and talk about maybe anything other than the latest political poison of the day. Mike, uh, the, the state attorney general is our organization. When, when we meet, there, there's not supposed to be any fundraisers, uh, including when we're in Washington. Now there can be before and after, <laughs> yeah. but during, during the meeting time, there, there's, there's no fundraisers. And that's, they've chipped away a little bit at that, but not too much. And, and I think that's very I, I healthy. Think that, I think that's true of the Governor's Association too, isn't it? I think so, yeah. Hey, uh, I want to get to some of the questions. Jeff's got them here, but before we do, and while we go through the, some of these, um, let me ask you the obvious question. So where do, you, where do you go from here? I mean, how do you achieve a more civil uh, legislative process, a more civil process where work gets done? You've kind of touched both of you on, on some things, but uh, give us some concrete examples of what can happen and how it can happen to try and achieve a, a government that works uh, I don't know, like Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan, or is that just more, is that more fantasy than fact? But anyway, how, how, do, they, how do you get to that point? Well, I, I think we've touched on some of it. You, first of all, there has to be a political reward for those that are uh, behaving better. Uh, there has to be some reward in the media for those thoughtful voices that are out there, rather than going to the shrillest and the loudest person, and we've had some discussion today about that, the media loves conflict, and they love you know, sharply worded things, they love the sound bites that can go on television, but maybe part of that is to sort of begin some discussion in schools of journalism, schools of communication about how important it is to promote and respect thoughtful dialogue, uh, how sources can be developed who are you know, a little more uh, generous in their way in which they describe policy issues or talk about their opponents. Uh, so, you know, in, in other words, create some incentives and some reward mechanisms that actually encourage good behavior because some, frankly, some of our incentives now run the opposite direction, that we reward people for saying crazy and mean and divisive things. Uh, so make those people pay a price and reward the people who seem to be doing the people's business in a, in a better way. 
In, in a way, what has been a great vehicle for us attorney generals is the multi-state cases that, that we bring as a, as a group of, of states against uh, uh, major companies and, and others, you know, tobacco, Microsoft, bank mortgage, and, and now opioids, among many others. And we really work together because uh, there's a common interest. Um, there's enormous resources on the other side. There's, there's a, an incentive to work together. Um, and uh, you know, we, we've been able to do that on, on a bipartisan basis for a long time. Uh, the best example is uh, one case a couple of years ago uh, dealing with a for-profit college, which was a priority of, of state attorney generals. Uh, we had 40 states uh, that joined in, in the settlement. There were 20 Democrats and 20 Republicans. So I don't, you know, I don't know how that can be duplicated in Washington, but when, when there is really a, uh, look for ways that, that there's a common interest like there is on the multi-states, and, and a lot of good things can be done. You have to get permission now, don't you, to get into a, um, a multi-state uh, case? Most, Some, uh, most, most not, we do not. Uh, <laughs> okay. Most of them are consumer cases and don't need it uh, for oh, that. Well, all right, just a little bit of legislative stuff that's going on here in Iowa, for those of you who aren't worried. Yeah. Keep, uh, keep quit bringing that up, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, what role do you think lobbyists and political action committees play in the polarization and incivility in Congress? If any, do you think that politicians uh, in or among congressmen, uh, the polarization, excuse me, among congressmen is related to PAC money or is it just to appeal to their constituents? I, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that I think the fundraising appeal that often goes out from the politicians or the campaigns does have a stridency to it that contributes to some of the nastiness. But I, I don't locate the dysfunction and the polarization in the fact that lobbyists are, you know, hosting campaign events for politicians and members of Congress. Uh, they, you know, the, the, the idea that you can find some evil somewhere that explains away all of these things is not very realistic. I mean, are there distortions that come about because Lobbyists have more access to some of our legislators and some of our elected officials. Yeah, but it's probably, frankly, at the margin. Uh, do PACs have enormous influence because they raise money? Yeah, but you know, it's, it, it's not, in fact, many politicians probably hold their nose and hate having to go raise money. Uh, would prefer not to have to meet some of these people that they have to go have dinner with because they're going to get a campaign contribution. So I, in fact, I think sometimes they almost like, like to stick it to those people just to prove that they are independent and not complete whores. Uh, so there, you know, there are different elements of that at work. I do think there is one campaign finance thing that should be corrected, and that's the so-called dark money that some PACs raise can give gobs of money to people that are totally uh, non-disclosed. I think disclosure is the disinfectant that actually, you know, holds everybody at least to some level of honesty. Yeah, I would agree. I think that, that the four forces that I, I mentioned earlier, the, partis the extreme partisanship, the uh, talk radio and, and cable news, the nationalist movement and Trump were much bigger factors in, yeah. in all of this. That's not to say that, um, uh, that campaign finance and dark money is, is something that's really important. Uh, it is, but for for different reasons. Um, uh, here's a good one for both of you. What specific examples uh, that you remember of Clinton or Obama behaving in a civil manner? In other words, perhaps in a situation where one of those two may have been in a, a challenged situation. Well, I mean, I'll, I mean, I'll, certainly with Clinton, uh, many uh, many instances of him having empathy for those who are suffering in some fashion. Uh, he loved picking up the phone and chatting people up. Uh, it drove some of the staff crazy sometimes that he had a, a particularly friendly relationship with Newt Gingrich, even though they were you know, at loggerheads on things like the, the federal budget and other issues. But they, uh, they had some weird kind of respect for each other because maybe in some ways they have similar personalities. Uh, so I, I saw instances like that, but, but in general, you know, every, what everyone always says about 
Bill Clinton is, oh, I met him and I shook his hand and he looked me in the eye and I was like the only person on the face of the planet. He just had that magnetic quality and he used that to effect when he was working with his political adversaries. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I, I'm trying to think of this. The question was a specific instance of that, but the, there were certainly a number of them in and around the government shutdown in 1995 and 96 when he had to sit there with people who were, you know, they were in moral combat around these budget issues. Uh, and he would take them out and said, let's, let's go over and let's go out to the putting green and knock some putts into the you know, hole. Because there's a putting green right outside in the Rose Garden, right outside the Oval Office. And so I, he took, you know, improbably took, uh, I'm forgetting one of, the, one of the senators, one of the senators that was giving him a particularly hard time, they went out, let's go out and, and putt. Dick Army uh, was someone that he uh, uh, did that to. So, I, you know, it's, just, it's, it's that kind of personal behavior. Now, interestingly, for Obama, I let you, you should chime in on Obama. Obama had a different way of interacting with people. I never heard anyone say, oh, Obama looked me in the line and shook my hands and I was the only person on the face of the planet because he tended to be more businesslike. Uh, but he also, I think on a, a number of occasions, gracefully reached out and gave us exactly the moment uh, that we needed. The one that I particularly remember was after the shootings in Charleston when he spoke at uh, Mother Emanuel AMA Church. And, you know, I, 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 it, it's not fair to make a com comparison probably, but Donald Trump is just utterly incapable of doing something like that. And we suffer as a country when we don't have a president who can reach high at a moment like that. Tom? Yeah, yeah just uh, uh, a small example, but it tells a little, little quite a bit about him. Um, when he, he announced uh, his candidacy in, in Springfield on that very cold Saturday afternoon, then immediately he came to Iowa. And one of his first stops the next day, um, he took a question. The question was, was really critical of, of President Bush's uh, foreign policy in, in one of the Latin American countries. and just was an opening to, to, attack, to attack Bush, which, which he didn't do. I mean, he, he disagreed with him, uh, but he didn't lay him out. Uh, he gave a somewhat nuanced answer, and uh, uh, I, I talked to him afterwards, and I, I, I mentioned that. And, and he said, well, Tom, he said, I can do raw meat as good as anybody else can. But he said, you don't, you don't do it all the time. That's, that's not, that's not how, you, how you handle yourself. Um, and the other thing, it's, it's, you know, it's hard to, it's, it's people forget about it. It's hard to believe now after everything that's happened about Obamacare. But, um, you know, he and, um, and the members of Congress, at his direction, uh, tried for about nine months to do it on a bipartisan basis. Um, and, and quite a bit of work was done on a bipartisan basis early. And some of the main ideas in, in Obamacare were originating, originated with, uh, with the Republicans. Um, uh, it all, you know, nine months in, it all fell apart and, and they divided on health care. He was very, very open for a long, long time. Was criticized by some Democrats for doing it that long, but uh, but certainly was. Is um, there is something potentially confining in quote treating others as we would want to be treated? Kind of that golden rule thing, this writer says. But uh, if that other person uh, comes from a background lifestyle very different from our own, kind of touched on this. How do we uh, move past our personal biases that could otherwise inhibit our ability to engage others with authentic civility. Hmm. Well, I, I, you know, being more conscious of diversity and being more self-aware about privileges, particularly if you are a white male uh, in our society, the privileges that have been extended to you and the hardships that others have had to wrestle with both historically and contemporarily. Uh, being more sensitive to exactly that uh, and understanding, we, we, we talked about that in the session earlier this afternoon, understanding that your place might be very different from the other person's place uh, and you're not making assumptions that the other person is going to 
easily understand and be comfortable with everything that you're about, and that you've got to bridge some of those differences to begin with. I think that it's all part of the, the human quality of civil discourse that yeah. we're trying to reach Walk out. Walk a mile for. in my shoes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And you know, understanding and 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 trying to put yourself in in their place and understanding where they're coming from. But bottom line, respect. Um, yeah. Extending extending respect to them. Um, you know, even if you screw a few things up in terms of, of what you understand or don't know, if they know you respect them, that makes a big difference. And it, and that, I, let, let's stipulate, that is very difficult to do when you see someone who is spouting hate or calling for violence or doing things that disrupt the harmony of the community, I think. There is a need then to understand where that anger, that behavior comes from. And we've got to pay closer attention to that. We've got to pay closer attention to people who will buy up an AR-15 and go shoot up a neighborhood. Right? Because that is, you know, a proximate problem that we face in the country. So, so we're not necessarily saying respect it goes for everything that the other person right. is about. But maybe tolerance and then working towards something that creates stronger and better community. And how do you take someone who's clearly an outlier in that community and either bring them in or put them in a place where they won't disrupt uh, the rest of us? Would polite behavior be considered a weakness, <coughs> a strong vocal candidate versus the polite candidate or lawmaker? Mm. Well, there, you know, there is some risk in that, um, that um, uh, the, the public uh, in their viewing elected officials want someone that's, that's strong and, and, and will fight back. So um, if you do appear uh, to be weak for, for whatever reason, including that, uh, uh, that you're civil and that you have respect, um, there is a point, um, and, and Mike was sort of and, and, you know, talking about s some areas, but, um, you know, y y you have to stand up uh, for what you believe in. You have to stand up against uh, what, what is wrong. Um, and and st you can still be civil in, in a lot of ways at the same time. That, that I think, I think if, if, if the public views you as, as someone who's generally civil and decent, um, but will stand up for what you believe in, um, stand up to people that unfairly challenge you. Um, that's a, that's a very powerful combination. Does the squeaky wheel always get the grease, Mike? Yeah, I mean, I mean that the, there is a problem here, but frankly, you all get to put the first test to that during the caucuses next year. There are candidates who are already being criticized because they're not vigorous enough, they're not hardcore enough. Uh, there are some candidates making the case, I'll take it to Trump stronger and better than anybody else will. But does that reinforce the kind of politics that we're somewhat lamenting today? Or is that the new normal? And I, I am hoping that we live up to that, you know, better quality of our uh, angels that can bring us to a different place and a different tone and a different vocabulary. And I, I kind of agree with what Tom said. I think a majority of Americans would reward that. Our problem is sometimes in the political process we have, particularly in the presidential uh, campaign cycle, it's the most strident activists. They're the most uh, participatory early in the process before a vast majority of other Americans are actually engaged. And I think we do need to think about that problem. We need those who are you know, participating in some of these early caucuses and primaries, you're gonna make decisions on behalf of the Democratic Party, my party, or even, I mean, there may be some activity on the Republican Party side. They need to think about what are we really setting up for the rest of the country? It's not just about me and my tribe, it's also about what the rest of the country needs in terms of leadership and where we're gonna move forward together. And that's a different kind of politics. Have we lost the ability to compromise? Well, we, we come, we've come or pretty close. Compromise? We, we've we come close to losing that ability. If you watch the Congress's inability to deal with some of the issues that have been on the national agenda for a long time, uh, you know, part of that is the different partisan control of the houses of our 
U.S. Congress. Uh, but it, it, it's also just because we, we've sort of lost the language, we've lost the ability to walk hand in hand with each other and really figure out what's the best course uh, together for our nation, as opposed to what maybe is in my particular political interest. Uh, I don't think it's entirely gone. I don't think we've lost the ability to get that work done. I mean, Tom has given us, you've given, given us some good examples of the way the attorneys general have worked together. But I think we need more examples of that. And we need to, you know, as I say, lift up those examples and talk about them more. Yeah, Mike, and another uh, factor in all of this, and one of the worst factors, is that significant segments of both parties will punish people in yeah. primaries if they compromise. Right, right. And that is, and that is a growing fear, and I, I think we, we have got to find politicians who are just willing to stand up to that kind of fear and say, I don't care, it's the right thing for me to do. And if someone wants to come and primary me from the other, you know, further out on the political spectrum, I will be willing to pay that price because I know I've been true to myself. So part of this is just having the courage of your own convictions. One of the other uh, questions that's kind of related here that says, yes, we do now pick our close uh, or choose our friends based on political parties. And as a question, it, it seems uh, this may be a result of Lee Atwater's politics of destruction. Not enough to win, but you have to destroy your opponent. Uh, so uh, this person's question is, uh, can we as a society survive in this atmosphere with this sort of philosophy? I, I, can, <laughs> Can the democracy, can, can the government survive? Is, is, this, is this something as big as um, really damaging the process? Well, of course we can survive. I mean, this is, a, this is a, an amazing country we live in. We're, we're extremely fortunate to live in, in the United States of America. But is it damaging? Do you it's think damaging. Political, it's, da oh, it's damaging, but, but certainly we're going to survive. We're going to survive all of this, I believe. Um, but in terms of the, the segmentation of, of people, it's... It's harmful for democracy, but um, you know, the, the, the public in the end, um, I think, figures things out. Um, in the short term, politicians can fool the public, but in the longer term, the public sort of figures it out and can, can, can make it all work. Um, and you know, just talking a little bit more about us you know, being in our, in our, in our, in our own groups, um, you know, I, think, I think that's something that uh, over a period of time, people are going to get uncomfortable with and, and sort of bored with. And um, uh, there's a natural cycle of things. And you know, I think we're going to want to talk to people that have different views, uh, uh, hopefully before, before too long. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. I think if the, the increasing diversity in this country, we, we see the demographics changing so much, will probably force us to begin to encounter the other, to really uh, learn how to deal with people who come from very, very different backgrounds because it'll inevitably, you won't be able to not encounter them because they're going to be right with you in the grocery line. They're going to be with you in the school. They're going to, you know, the, all of the walks of life are going to reflect some of the diversity that is America. And I think that then will force us to do to, to a better job of uh, both being social and figuring out how we come together and do our politics together in a, in a better way. Uh, so I, I kind of I agree with you. I'm not, I'm not a pessimist to say, I mean, we may, we may have to break it pretty bad before we get it fixed. And we're sort of on the way. And we're sort of on the way there. What, to breaking it or to getting it fixed? To breaking it pretty bad, oh, but then okay. getting it fixed. Right. So it's going to get worse before but it gets better? It could, it could. But I think the reaction to that is that we, we would instill some new kind of national leadership that would have as a goal putting the pieces back together again. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's entirely possible, and that's what we do when we have major important national campaigns. Now, will, it, will we have that next year? It, I think it's a little too early to tell at this point. But uh, if it gets so bad that people generally decide we've, we've got to do something different, then I think it rather than just giving up and throwing your hands up and saying, I'm not participating, I think the, the reaction of most Americans, given our spirit, would be the opposite. That we say, we're gonna, we're gonna go fight for this country and we're gonna have a revolution and we're gonna put some people in there that know how to do our business in a way that we 
we expect them to do it. Well, with that kind of optimistic look to the future and the fact we have like about three minutes left here, let me just kind of toss it to you in a general sort of summation question. And when it comes to the whole idea of civility or lack thereof in government, um, kind of summarize your thoughts. We touched on, you know, where we're going to go and things, but uh, down deep, uh, what do you really feel uh, about what this has done to the country? And, um, and maybe elaborate a little bit more as far as, as what can be done to try and solve it. You, you always look at me. <laughs> I look at you. I'll go first this time. You go first. I'll go first this time. Um, you know, I, th I, think, I think the fabric of the country has, has, has been harmed uh, um, in, in recent years. Um, in, some, in, in, major, in major degree of, uh, as a result of those four forces that I described, but for, for, other, for other reasons that, uh, that, uh, as well. But it's, like I say, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, we have a remarkable country. I mean, we've come back from, from so many difficult situations, a, a civil war, um, two world wars, incredible depression, McCarthyism that I, that I talked about before. Um, you know, I have faith that, that, that we can do that. And um, a lot of the answers are around some of the things that were, were said here today. Um, um, to move towards civility, to, to move towards, towards, towards facts and, and holding people to facts, um, and treating people with, with respect. Um, understanding that this is a very diverse country and, and uh, you know, how we, how we handle that and how we I gain enormous value from that. Um, so you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a terrible optimist and, and continue to be one. Although recognize that, um, that 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 there that, that there's a lot of different things that have gone on that shouldn't have gone on. That there's been damage to our country. That there's been damage to our standing in in, in the world and our ability to to lead the world. Um, so that, you know, I, I I'm unrealist enough to understand that, but but still think that, um, that we're gonna find a way to, to bring this back. Pragmatic right. optimism from the Attorney General. Mike, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I think that is all right, exactly correct. I think the one other thing that I think we need to do is to celebrate and lift up the lives of those who are exemplary public servants. Um, my first trip here to Iowa was in 1984 for the caucus, and I was working for Senator John Glenn, who was a remarkable human being and a true national hero. He was not the greatest politician, as you in Iowa decided, but uh, <clears throat> there were qualities to him that really spoke to character. Um, Tom and I were talking earlier about our good friend Bruce Babbitt, who was governor of Arizona, when he came here to Iowa to campaign for president, he wound up being secretary of the interior, uh, did a great job, uh, almost too good a job, because you know Clinton was gonna appoint him to the Supreme Court. And then he ran into opposition from some of the Western senators that didn't like uh, the policy, but he was smart, interesting, committed, passionate person. Exactly the kind of person that you wanna see uh, more of in politics. I mentioned earlier Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was cantankerous and could drive you crazy, but he probably is one of the last true public intellectuals that we've had uh, of a serious nature in the United States Congress. I mean, he wrote more books uh, than most senators have probably read. Um, <laughs> and then last, and this will be my last comment, when you find a truly extraordinary public servant who demonstrates the qualities we've been talking about them, you hang on to them. And hanging on to Tom Miller as your Attorney General for lo these many years has been a very, very wise thing for you to do because he's exactly the kind of example of the leader that would help us overcome some of the poison and the dis sad discourse that we have today. So Thank you. I've known him for 33 years now and uh, I, I can tell you, he hasn't missed once. So. Yeah. Well, Mike, I'm glad you came out to Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> um, gentlemen, Mike McCurry, Tom Miller, thank you both very much. We hear it for our panel. Thank Thanks, my friend. Gary and Linda, thank you very much.
Uh, we do appreciate your wonderful sponsorship of this entire event. And uh, thanks, to, uh, thanks to those of you who are here today. All right. A big thank you to our last panel. <laughs> Before I invite Jeff White to the podium to give some concluding remarks as the co-chair of the Greenlee Summit, Greenlee Summit Planning Committee, I want to take a moment to recognize the many people who have made this event possible. First, I would like to thank again our sponsors. Our initial major sponsor, the Carrie and Linda Killinger Foundation. Thank you very much. Our networking reception sponsor, the Meeks Group, industry partners, Cox Media Group, PRSA of Central Iowa, Our Iowa Magazine, Iowa Bankers Association, Iowa Realty, Strategic America. Our Greenlee supporters, Flynn Wright, Two Rivers Marketing, Iowa State University College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and Iowa State University Office of the Senior Vice President of Student Affairs. And our in-kind contributors, the Des Moines Business Record, Fine Focus Media, Flynn Wright, Iowa State Daily Media Group, Meredith Corporation, and the Robert D. and Billy Ray Center, Drake University. Thank you again. Your generous support has made the Greenlee Summit possible. I also want to recognize the many people in the Greenlee School and throughout Iowa State University who have worked tirelessly on the Summit Planning Committee. I know not everyone could stay till the end, but if you are here, I expect you to stand proud so you can be recognized when I read your name. Stacy Horner, Jan Lauren Boyles, Maria Charbonneau, Karen Kodrowski, Casey Opfer, Angela Powers, Jose Rosa, Stefan Schmidt, Aaron Wilgenbush, and Kelly Winfrey. Thank you all for your hard work. I also want to thank members of the Greenlee School Advisory Council who have served on the Summit Planning Committee and who have been instrumental in our connection with our industry partners and with a lot of heavy lifting. Please stand as well as I read your name. Jeff White, Lawrence Cunningham, Tara Dealing Hansen, Denise Essman, Susan Kennedy Hood, Barb Iverson, Dave Kearns, Kathy Obradovich, Nancy Padberg, Rick Phillips, Terry Rich, Dan Winters, and Donna Ray Makers on. Thank you all. And then Jeff, would you come up here and join me at the podium? He does not know we're doing this. Jeff has served as the co-chair of the Greenlee Summit Planning Committee, and we joke that in doing so, he took on another full-time job. He has carried a very heavy load, and much of what you saw today would not have happened without his work. And so for that, we want to give him a small token of our appreciation. <laughs> and we hope that this will remind him of his dedication to the Greenlee School, to Iowa State University, and to communications in civility in our democracy. Please join me in a round of applause to thank Jeff. <laughs> Ah, yes, the coveted spot between the final thank yous and the cocktails. And everybody has a free drink ticket in their pocket. So I'll indeed be brief. We, know, we already know that you enjoyed today. Um, we assume you were informed. We hope you were inspired. That's what this was all about. Inspired by the fact that we all have a responsibility, a deep responsibility here as the only professional, communica professional communicators in the country. Yes, there are citizen journalists. Yes, there are people communicating all over social media, communicating themselves and communicating whatever they would like, but we are the professionals. We have a responsibility to keep our audiences intact because when we lose them because of distrust or disgust, nobody wins and in the end, our democracy erodes. So please continue to carry this conversation forward. In fact, we hope you, you saw and appreciated the idea that we weren't just stating the obvious today, that there's a problem, everybody agrees on that, and that we should all be doing something about it, everyone agrees on that too. But we hope that you saw how we designed the problem-solving portion, especially right after lunch. And in fact, we're taking that forward with the Robert and Billy Ray Center at uh, uh, Drake University. We're going to do a report out on what those sessions concluded, and in fact, we already have sessions lined up to push those forward to groups like Public Relations Society of America and others so we can continue 
the conversation with our colleagues and our peers. So please help us do that because none of this will work unless we all carry it forward. It starts from the inside out. We have a survey that will go out to everyone on Monday morning. It'll be in your email box. Please fill it out. Tell us what you think. Tell us what we did right. Tell us what we can do better so we can continue to do all of this together. So thank you again to all of our panelists. Thank you for that last wonderful panel. Thank you all for coming, and we'll hope to see you next year. Thank you. Oh, no. <laughs>